So I like literally like yesterday and even this morning, I was like on TikTok just watching all these like hilarious- Dude, it's a black hole. I can't watch TikToks. What's up, everyone? It's Andrew Bermudez, co-founder and CEO of Digsy. If you want to dual lend more deals on your commercial real estate properties, go to getdigsy.com and sign up. You can start listing for free. I've got my wonderful co-host, Bucky and Natalie. What's, What's up, everybody? So, Natalie, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself in like less than like two letters? I'm kidding. You can just no. tell us <laughs> something that. <laughs> two letters. ABC, uh, you always be closing. I'm like, there you go. So I'm over at Logic Commercial. I'm a vice president in the tenant rep division uh, with a focus on office and flex tenants in the Las Vegas market. Sweet. Bucky, your turn. Commercial real estate agent, and I'm trying to become TikTok famous. Yeah. Woo. And actually, if you're not following Bucky on TikTok, it's awesome. I do have one request. You need to wear that hamburger t-shirt all the time, man. Yeah. It's not oh, even yeah. a t-shirt, just like a shirt, that hamburger we shirt. I keep... you that every show. Bucky, wear the shirt, please. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's the most delicious shirt I've ever seen in my life. I love that. <laughs> a little awkward when I show up to an appointment and I'm wearing the hamburger shirt for the first time and they've never met me before. So that's what I got. I got to bring a couple shirts to the office. <laughs> Dude, next year, next year I'm inviting you to my 40th and I'm going to pay for your flight along with Natalie's. And if that shirt's not being worn, literally I will lock you in the closet for the rest of the night. Oh my God. <laughs> it's pretty bad. That's how much I want that shirt. Well, we have wonderful guests here. We have Brittany with Cressa. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I work in the West Los Angeles market. I've been in real estate for about eight years and I specialize in office space with a focus on tech and media tenants. Awesome. Thank you for that. And we have the amazing Vicky Lee who is an expert in flexible um, office space solutions. So what's up, Vicki? Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, very nice to meet you guys. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, so we are a flexible office space uh, solution company. Um, so based in San Francisco. And, you know, last year we, I mean, two years ago, we also expanded to the LA area. So, you know, in California, we have uh, eight locations including uh, six in the Bay Area, two in the LA area. And um, so we actually are specializing in helping fast growing tech companies, uh, you know, to kind of like uh, move into a, a ready to move in office space and also provide our flexible management services to the companies who doesn't have to, you know, use their current office space. So let, thank you for that, Vicky. So let's address the big elephant in the room, right? What the fuck happened to WeWork, man? $47 billion? I know. It's not. <laughs> Come on, Nat Natalie. We're um, all in commercial real estate. We're all adults. You're really going to fault me for making the uh, the F word? I'm not, but that's yeah. my client. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steer clear of this entire conversation. Oh, you work with WeWork. I'm going to duck underneath my desk. Oh, this is, this is getting edited out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You. So how okay. about those other people? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so anyway, so that, that's an interesting thing, right? That's actually pre-COVID that this whole thing happened when they try to, uh, when they try to go public. But at the same time, it's actually uh, put a little bit of a sting on the co-working solution. So what are you noticing out there, Brittany, as far as like when, are people even talking about co-working? Does it have a stigma? Like what are you seeing out there? Right now it does have a stigma. I think most people when this happened, because everyone was watching WeWork and potentially that it was, you know, they were doing terribly, they messed up their IPO. And then when, COVID came down, it just kind of accelerated a lot of natural processes that were already occurring, like with retail as well, that was going through a big transition. Um, but right now, I think most folks are, everyone that could cancel those agreements did because they, they had short-term agreements, flexible agreements, and so they were particularly vulnerable to a crisis like this. And so you just saw tenants exiting en masse. They've got tenants, you know, filing suits against them and all this kind of stuff going on right now. So. Um, I think that the flexible workspace will survive, obviously, because um, it does provide a really creative solution for clients that don't want to commit to a long term, but they're going to have to really take a look at what their customer needs to feel safe. And Vicki, you, mm -hmm. you kind of like lie yeah. right, right in that line where somebody might consider you co-working, right? So kind of mm -hmm. what, 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 like, what have you seen like, is it the fact that, is it really the COVID thing where like people are afraid to, you know, sit next to each other and they kind of think like, 
oh, cooties, you know, I'm going to be sitting around people. I want to be safe. Or is it much more, hey, why do you laugh, Natalie? You always laugh at the stuff I say. Because you said cooties. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get right. back into it. You, you make me <laughs> chuckle. You and Bucky are the best. I love you guys. Um, so, Vicky, is it is it the COVID thing or is it like people looking at WeWork and some, some of that shade like going to the co-working spaces? I mean, right. I, I'm sure that like you being more of a flex uh, provider, you kind of get coupled into that into into that, that yes. co-working pool. Can you, is it COVID or is it or is it just like the shade that, you know, of, of somebody's downfall? Right. So thank you so much for that question. That actually a question that I have been thinking for almost a year. So definitely, you know, this is prior to COVID. It is not something new. Um, so, you know, if we just, you know, look into a co-working space, there are, you know, company like WeWork where, you know, they spend majority of their money on community building. So, you know, community is very expensive. So, you know, they constantly hosting a lot of fancy events. You know, they provide beer, like they provide wine, they provide all those happy hours for free. So everything is really, you know, just kind of the cost comes towards the community. So community is very, very, very expensive. And what's more challenging is how can we monetize that, right? So there is, you know, is it valuable in terms of brand reputation? Yes, for sure. Everybody, not maybe not everybody, but you know, at least you know, people people in commercial real estate, all of them they know exactly what uh, co-working space is, or they they know exactly what we work is. So that's definitely you know the money well spent on educating commercial real estate brokers and also tenants about you know what is co-working and who we work is. On the other side, you know, there is great co-working space companies such as Spaces or Regis, IWG, right? Those kind of companies. So, you know, they didn't really spend that much of money on community building. You know, they don't really offer um, so free events or they don't really offer, you know, those kind of like free amenities for use. Rather, you know, they charge a lot. Like for every use of, every other use of meeting rooms, they charge something extra. For every copy you print, they also charge something extra. So th this is actually definitely, you know, very, very different. You know, start about almost a year ago, you know, we we'll, we kind of like constantly spending. So one of the time that I kind of like stopped thinking, like, what do I want to do? Because I am like, to be honest, I'm also confused. Like if I continue, you know, making a lot of like wonderful events happening and then, you know, to really kind of like spend a lot of money on community, but is my company still able to survive? Is there any way that I actually can find a way to monetize our product? The question is, is challenging. And then the other side of it is we don't really want it to be like a property management-ish kind of company or, you know, just pure facility management company. We charge every money, I mean, every penny on top of our clients because that's really not what the market was looking for. Not really, you know, that's just something has to change. And then apparently, you know, so I think COVID is only a salary the market's understanding on really helping uh, flexible office space providers to really realize that, you know, the, uh, the tenants or the potential clients in the co-working space industry today, what their need. Um, so, you know, it's definitely a change from a community based where, you know, basically it's a market that WeWork has spent a lot of money on. And then to like a transition of helping the tenants realize that, you know, for uh, doesn't matter if we wanted to cut co-working space or flexible office based providers, basically the tenants are looking for a service uh, kind of like based solutions in, the help, in help, helping their companies to, you know, uh, get into the right track in, ter in terms of workspace management. Yeah, so totally, you know, that's what I think COVID is really uh, the momentum that accelerates the realization from, you know, a community sense to a more kind of like efficient uh, a service sense. So that's really what I kind of like over uh, look at the current uh, co-working space industries. So let's talk about this because in this podcast, we, we talk mm -hmm. a lot about marketing and lead generation strategies uh, and, and tools and things that you can do, little hacks here and there to kind of, you know, draw in more tenants, more buyers to either put in your properties or represent. Now, when you're doing mm -hmm. all these community events, like what, I'm sure that's great for branding and exposure. You know, a friend brings a friend and, you know, next thing you know, they're, they're by the kegerator drinking beer and they go, oh, I need space. I'm going to go to the, to, to, to this particular uh company, right? Or this, this mm -hmm. space, let's just call it ABC space. Um, 
what is really the solution? Like, why are they attracted to that? Were they attracted because of the community building or is it more because, oh, I can just rent the desk or I can rent more desk or I get to hang out with my buddies? Like, have, have, have you been in the industry of flexible space? Like, have you really nailed down kind of like the one, two, two, maybe three, like levers of what, like that, that's really the value proposition for these, uh, you know, tenants that occupy these spaces? Like what really is the, the, the value proposition or, or what they consider valuable mm-hmm. to themselves? Is it the community? Is it the flexibility? Like what really is it like? I, I'd like to know, you know, the, the number one, like the thing that everybody says and then the next thing. And then if there's a third thing there, can you share that with us? Yeah, sure. Um, I would like to say that there are two levels of, you know, community engagement. So one is, you know, really help the decision maker. Normally it's the CEO or, you know, it's the um, CFO of the companies, right? So when they actually look into um, office space solution, um, especially, you know, in a co-working space industry or flexible office space industry. So they are constantly looking for two types of things. One is the service that I already mentioned. The other one is the add-on value community. What do you have? So for one piece work, because, you know, we have 10 locations globally, like we have eight in the States, we also have two in China. So our value proposition is really, you know, helping a lot of like Chinese clients, you know, enter uh, U.S. Cor- uh, correctly and also efficiently. So, um, you know, TikTok is also one of our clients, actually. Um, so, you know, we're actually helping them. Uh, uh, we actually didn't provide the workspace solution to them. We actually provided consultancy solutions to them. Um, so, you know, like that's really on top of the workspace solution, but it's more about go to and uh, go to uh, go to market entry kind of like analysis on helping you know a lot of like Chinese companies really understand the demands of local U.S. market and also you know hopefully by setting I mean by connecting them to the right resources to help them accelerate the enter uh, uh, the go to market entry faster. Uh, you know, companies also, vice versa, like Linebike is also our largest client. We actually help them to launch their office space in Shenzhen, which is in China. So that is also, you know, just on top of one piece work, what is our value proposition from that approach? And then the other level of, you know, community events is uh, like engagement is more about like the, uh, the community events to, uh, to, uh, to increase retention rate for the talent by itself. So those people, they are not necessarily decision making, like makers to actually, you know, um, to make decisions whether they wanted to work in this office or not, because, you know, eventually it's just the company's decision. However, what we can do, you know, by, you know, connecting this tenants in here or talents in the space is really, you know, by one, continue uh, throwing, you know, social events. Uh, to really uh, figure out, you know, what kind of things they need. For example, Santa Monica, we did a bunch of, you know, social events such as be dating, apparently become one of the, the most beautiful kind of like, or uh, how to say that, attractive events uh, locally. However, we did that in Silicon Valley. It's like the vibe is, is not as much, you know, we figure out that, yeah. So the, the people are different, like Santa Monica, you know, everybody is in a kind of like entertainment industry versus in Silicon Valley, almost everybody is coming from engineer industry, then you probably wanted to throw different kind of events to really engage those people together. And then, you know, we change, we change topic to uh, something like more uh, kind of like advanced in terms of technology. And then we actually get great feedback from our talents in the space. Like people are just, you know, kind of crazy about what's the future of technology is going to be. And then what about what's going on with the investment uh, word and things like that. So, you know, all this kind of type of events is really to just engage the talents and then to build trust in uh, among those talents to, uh, to make sure like they trust our community. They feel happy to come into our space every day. They wanted to stay with that company they're working for longer. Natalie, what, what, from, you talk to tenants all day long. So like, what, what are some of the drivers you see from people wanting to go to like a co-working space or, or a flexible type setup? Just flexibility, being able to pop in and out. So let's say like in a WeWork model where they're in multiple markets, being able to go in and out and use the space. Um, obviously the culture vibe that it gives, the, the amenities that are inside, the ability to have a conference room and invite people to your space and there's a big open kitchen and fresh tea and so just really the flexibility would be the main thing and then the amenities and everything else would be the second. And just being, it's almost like a, it's a cool trend to be in co-working space. I have friends that pride themselves 
um, even though they're best friends, a tenant rep office broker, that they are in, you know, they're in their co-working space. And then there's their synergy there, right? You're with other entrepreneurs. There's a chance to really network and grow your brand. And um, but those are the main movers. I don't have a lot of clients that are looking for that. I don't know about you, Brittany, but do you have a lot of clients that come to you and say that they're looking at co-working? I think the most often that I'm looking at co-working with the client is when they're not sure about their needs in a certain market and they want to dip their toe in. And the term is a, is a big factor. I would say that's the top factor because when you go into co-work, you're paying a premium. So it has to be worth it for some reason or another. And most often that is to not commit to a, a big lease term and decrease the overall office liability in that way. Um, it depends on whether we're talking about a company or just a small group of employees. And now it's more common for companies to hire remotely in other cities. So they may just have a couple employees that need an office in any given city or one. And, and co-working makes a really great solution for that scenario. Um, you know, I think the other, the other thing that can be really good is though you're paying a premium, you're paying just for the space that you use. Often you're paying per head. So if your employee count changes, then your costs go down. So that can be very attractive. That's a really good point. Yeah. And do you find that you're actually taking people out of co-working um, as opposed to putting them into it because they've, they've discovered the market, they've done their research, they know where they want to be. And so we move them into permanent space. Or, or do you find that as well? I, yes, that is, that can be the case. Sometimes um, they may keep a small membership at the co-work place because they like the culture and the amenities, but then, you know, they, open up their flagship office because they want the face of their company. They want the headquarters. Um, you know, the private office solution in WeWork, I think is, is a really interesting case right now because a lot of folks that had a lock on their doors, if, if something does happen to WeWork and it, you know, they are restructured and all that kind of stuff. So we have a lot of clients that are looking to protect their space right now because they are in a, in a co-work space and they're not feeling great about their, their, landlord so it's it's interesting there's so many different cases i think which is one of the reasons why we work has been so successful because it fills it checks a lot of boxes for yes. a lot of different people and that community that vicky's talking about is so critical and people love that ability to network when they go into the office one of the things i think that one piece does so well though is they've really found their niche community in the chinese entrepreneurial market and i know they've got big name companies in there you've got don't you have uh, Alibaba's in your in China and yeah, here? And you've got a few big yeah. big it's companies in there that you've been able to mm -hmm. really carve out this niche. And so WeWork has has this you know much broader scope, I would say, in that regard, which can be good. But maybe in a more scaled down version, actually, more boutique co working setups like One Piece will actually prevail. We'll see. Bucky, what's uh, what's the Bucky, what's the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Vicki, I just want to ask Bucky, uh, mm -hmm. to have him what, what's the co-working and flexible market like in Rochester? So being home of the Mayo Clinic, we um, have what I'll call an accelerator that Mayo had started for doctors to have a place where they can start a company and it's oh, that's cool. connected to the Mayo Clinic. So that was more of a local city and Mayo combined effort to create that on a smaller scale. It's probably 2,000 square feet plus or minus. And then we had a small startup uh, in a garage called The Cube, which eventually developed into what's called Collider. And that's more just hot desks, if you will. You can come in, you can get a dedicated desk for 350 a month, or you can have this day pass where you come and go. And then myself, personally, I just created a, I'll call it executive suite in downtown Rochester, close to Mayo Clinic. It's seven offices. I'm in one of the offices right now. And I've had it now for about two years. We're not 100% full. I think it just shows that in these smaller markets, it's a good idea. And, it's, and I really enjoy our space for the fact that I have a media company down the hall and a loan officer and people that understand the benefits of being downtown and having a reasonable rent. But it's not as popular in a smaller market as it is in a bigger market. I do see that it takes longer time to fill up spaces. So let's talk about this. So we, we're making this transition where you have code work and everybody packed. Like it sounds like community is a big, big thing that attracts people networking, having, you know, kind of having these uh, serendipitous meetings with, you know, the, the media company down the hall. 
Uh, but really what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a change in, as I'm, I'm speaking with people where it goes between just co-working and being all, all, all of those uh, community things, even though it seems like it's still critical to being much more of a flexible provider where it means I'm seeing more and more companies say, as opposed to you sharing a desk or having just a small part of an office is actually chopping up a big chunk of office, let's say like 5,000 feet, six, seven, 8,000 feet. I know that. Uh, Vicky, that one piece has some of these big spaces that you guys are marketing as turnkey spaces uh, for these companies that are unsure what's going to happen with COVID and they need a short-term solution, right? Whether their lease is expiring mm -hmm. or whether they're downsizing, uh, et cetera. So can we, can, can you shed a little bit of light? I'd like to hear from you, Vicky, and then I'd like to hear from Brittany as well to kind of see, you know, the broker perspective uh, of these emerging uh, it, it almost seems like it, it, it's almost like an evolution of co-working going into a more uh, traditional flex uh, flexible space solution for for for, for tenants and I, I'm interested to see what what the pressures on landlord or on, on natural landlords as well since right so here is what I thought you know so under the co-working space name there are two type of things one is called shared space the other one is a flexible workspace solution so, you know, for shared space, um, so today, if we look into the market around us, you know, there are like all kind of like shared workspace, they call themselves co-working space, right? So basically, it's a product that people all come together and then they share the public space where they share the office space that they're using. And then there is flexible, you know, workspace. So that's really what we are doing. Like, we have multiple locations, but if you, we just actually pick out, let's say, a one piece work San Francisco by itself, if they don't have any other like further locations, you know, I only wanted to call it it's a shared workspace. Because flexible workspace, it's a package of all the possibilities that you have. And all that together is actually a solution what is called flexible office space. So there are tenants in the market, um, they are looking for not only just one office solution for that one local market, rather, you know, they're looking for a really kind of like a flexible workspace solutions that can cater the needs for their talents to be able to choose wherever they feel more convenient. So, you know, what I think is, you know, for flexible workspace solutions, we cannot say ourselves, oh, we are a, a flexible workspace management solution if we only have one location. We have to have multiple locations and then to put it all together as a whole package and then, you know, present to our clients, okay, so you are looking for a talent, I mean, a workspace solutions for your talents at a distributed area. And then here is, you know, the options that we have. So we actually wanted to engage all this package to you and your clients, I mean, your talent. This is really, you know, what the service is going to be look like, rather than, you know, it's just one dedicated kind of like workspace in that market, like people all come in together to work together. Then that's actually a very different concept. Can you, so, you can, know, for... Vicky, can, can mm -hmm. you, I want to get clear on this so that, so that the audience really understands this. Yeah. Can you give me a mm -hmm. use case? Uh, so can you walk us through yeah. a use case of a company looking for this, like why the package of having several buildings is important to them and, you know, what their, what, what their area looks like. Do they have their own front door? Do they have their own enclosed area? Can you just, let's just say, uh, just grab one of the companies who's gone forward uh, with us with a flexible right. solution like that? Okay, cool. So I'm very happy to use Lineback as an example. So, you know, they started from our San Francisco office. You know, they are one of the most kind of like fast growing tech companies over the past two years. Um, so, you know, as they grow out of our San Francisco office, of course, you know, they're too big. We cannot, you know, kind of like take over them as our clients anymore. And then they have to move out. However, you know, for tech companies like them, they constantly looking for office solutions in different uh, markets that they wanted to enter. You know, so we actually become the flexible office providers to actually help them to launch their team in Santa Monica, in Seattle, and also in Shenzhen. Because this is where, you know, they also wanted to come in. This is where their, their, their talents is also going to be at. So, you know, rather than them only wanting to, you know, uh, looking for a space in San Francisco, you know, by working with One Piece org, like we have multiple locations, we, we are can't really catering their needs, you know, we actually offer this entire office space as a product to them or as a service to them to really fulfill their needs. So they don't really have to consider where do we want it to go to, uh, I mean, which office do we want it to pick the next when we actually enter a different market. So, you know, that's also kind of like collaborate our 
location picking strategy. We don't just randomly, you know, open locations anywhere that we think is suitable. It's more about, you know, because we definitely, you know, um, the clients we really focus on is fast growing tech companies, you know, eventually cross border companies. So our location picking uh, strategy is really kind of like following where these companies wanted to go. That's where we, we wanted to go as well, because we are part of the solutions or services to them. So basically, it's you're dealing with one vendor, the the the, the flex space provider. You need to expand to different mm-hmm. markets. Uh, they may outgrow your San Francisco facility, but they're looking to expand in Santa Monica or Shenzhen, and you're able to. They're able to go to you, and then you're able to just kind of like turnkey it so they can focus on work, and then your team works with their team to deploy that additional physical real right. estate for the additional talent that they're hiring. That's super interesting. Right. I, think. I, I haven't. That's really Thank cool. You look you guys up um i really like that and uh, Brittany, i mean yeah i what? think go ahead sorry mm-hmm. vicky go ahead sorry yeah i think from the commercial real estate perspective you know the way to think of us is more like a global uh tenant wrap for one company mm-hmm. and you know so we yeah. don't really just focus on the local market but at the same time you know we're really helping you to uh enter uh that you are desired market yeah that's interesting now, Brittany, what, I mean, what's, what, what are some of the solutions you're seeing out there outside of, of One Piece? Like, are you seeing like individual offices or are you seeing like them just sharing, like the shared space? Like what, what, what are some of the work in general? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think right now, um, anybody that had a membership, you know, they're, they've probably canceled it. Anyone that, that still has it, that, that might already be in that setup Folks that are looking for new space right now, I think, especially if they're planning on going back to work anytime soon, prefer mm-hmm. to have control over their space. Okay. So if they can do that by having a private space in a WeWork, they may consider it. But most of the companies that I'm touring with right now, even a shared sublease makes them nervous. So it's, And this is because of COVID? Yes. So okay. I think until that's kind of worked out, and I know right now uh, most companies are putting together their p- policies and procedures to go back to work as well as landlords. And we've started to get some of those documents in, but they're just a handful. And it looks like, of course, as we expect, the landlords are working closely with their lawyers to make sure that their plans aren't going to impact any lease provisions and potentially give tenants some kind of, uh, you know, a little way out of the lease, whether it's inhibiting access with uh, limiting people on the elevators or requiring people to come in in phased entry. So I think that all of those things right now are really at the top of, of folks' minds. And I think that when we emerge from this, um, and as we emerge, that, that co-working providers, and I know Vicki is doing this too, are, are planning to make their spaces you know, visibly look safer with all of these different upgrades, whether they're hand sanitizers or touch-free doors or whatever it is to just make people feel more comfortable and safe when they're in these spaces. And once the word gets out and people start to actually feel that way, that, that it will recover. But I think for the moment, people are a little bit nervous because they just don't know what it's going to look like. Now, Natalie, Bucky, like why, why would you guys, in addition to being a solution for the client, of course, because that's the number one thing, but what incentives are these uh, flexible and, and space providers providing you as a broker to bring a deal in to them? They have heightened commission splits here in Las Vegas. So the commission is more than you would make on an average lease term in terms of the amount per square foot. Um, but obviously I'd rather do a long-term lease of larger space, but here they do incentivize through um, just commissions. A, higher, a heightened split. Got it. Bucky? In a small market, at least my experience, there's no incentives. They don't even offer commission. <laughs> and really? for, the fact, for the fact that it's such a small market that, people are going to find it if they were to go to Google. And so they don't feel that they have to offer it. And, um, and so not to say I wouldn't try personally out of the space that I own and operate, have a master lease on and then sublease spaces. Um, I would offer it. Right. But I don't have, because of the lack of demand, I don't have a lot of brokers knocking at my door. Um, but I think the local community of brokers would definitely recognize it and be happy to compensate them for their time. Uh, one thing I was just going to comment I was unique out of this whole pandemic for our space is we had a school teacher come to us and I worked out a deal because one, uh, appreciate the income coming in, even though it wasn't exactly what we were asking, but she could not work from home and she wanted her own dedicated office and we worked out something in our space. So 
just something I didn't plan on when we created this space. That's interesting. That's cool. That's cool. Well, that, thank, thank you for taking care of the teachers too, man. That's really awesome. I believe they're highly underpaid and I, I mean, they educate our, the, you know, our future leaders and I just think we need to be doing more for them. So I appreciate that, Bucky. I agree with you, Andrew. You still I have to open. leave everybody. I have a tour. I'm so sorry. I hate that. Maybe we can cut this part out. It's That's great fine. to meet you all. You guys are amazing. It was mm -hmm. great to meet you all. Great thank you so much. You. Yeah. Thank Bucky, you, Becky. Thank you. Bucky, helping that teacher, that teacher does not mean that you don't have to wear the hamburger shirt later. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, so, so now that uh, we finally got rid of uh, Natalie, we're able to actually talk trash. Um, so the, the, the thing that I wanted to kind of touch on is, Vicky, like what incentives do you see out there for like, like well, here's what I heard. Flex providers mm -hmm. get 10%, maybe 15% of their, of their transaction volumes of new tenants through brokers. Does that sound mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. That's that sounds about right. Yeah. And is, is the majority of your business actually just referral or is it Google AdWords? What is it? Um, so I would say, um, you know, majority of that, it, it is actually coming from Google and about like 20% of that is actually from uh, brokers and uh, the rest of us is very organic. Okay. Um, so Google definitely works, but if we actually look into the cost that we, spend on client acquisition it's actually not cheap you know the keywords are so expensive nowadays and there doesn't matter if it's like co-working or flexible workspace solutions or you know anything related with office space it's very expensive and um the quality is not as great as you you know always kind of like expect if we talk about conversion rate um you know definitely brokers give us much more qualified uh leads and the conversion rate is actually much higher. It's actually three times higher than Google, what Google give us. Yeah. So Google only give us volume, but brokers definitely give us qualities. That's right. Because a broker wouldn't spend their time unless they pre-screen the, so you've got two screens. Mm -hmm. You've got, you already know that a deal will come with financials, et cetera. So that makes sense. Brittany, what about like, I mean, I'm sure that we've kind of like beat this whole thing to death on, on uh, so flexible space. Like for you have being a tenant rep broker, like, is there a distinction in your mind? What is flexible space and what is co-working space? Or is that still muddled uh, for you in your mind? I think I would say it's still muddled. Um, it's, it's because they're by the same, you know, vendor basically are offering these solutions. So we've got some other boutique ones in Santa Monica. Spaces is over here and has a big, a big setup down here in Santa Monica. And then Breather is one that they'll take individual suites and, furnish them, upgrade them, and then release them back to a single company or maybe multiple people. And so I think that really falls into that flexible workspace category because it's got the amenities and all that, but they're like, they're a single suite. And so if a tenant was leasing space from them and breather was to go under, then they would just be able to keep their space as is and, and stay in the building. Um, but yeah, I think they're, they're still pretty muddled. Vicky, since you're in, since you're an expert in the space, tell us that the the like if if you were talking to a four year old, which I am one, mm -hmm. right? Not forty four. Yeah. That's how my mind thinks. Um, like, yeah. what's the difference between flexible space and and co working? Yeah. So, um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, co working space is basically uh, kind of like a community based space that you focus on, you know, sharing. Um, a lot of like amenities with others, but flexible workspace is more, you know, focused on the service perspective. Uh, you know, a lot of the times we cannot provide customer, I mean, standard service to any clients. Every um, service needs to be customized. Um, so that is really how I look into the difference between co-working and flexible. So long story short, one is like they deliver standard service as what it is, as we all know. The other one is more like the flexible workspace solutions, more customized to really, you know, provide a service that fits the needs of the, uh, the clients. So does that mean, for example, when you're sharing space, you might have two people in a long desk, right? Standing six feet apart or mm -hmm. not standing, but sitting unless they're, mm -hmm. they're, they've been drinking a little bit too long during the community event. Um, but is the flexible part, does that mean that they have like their own region and a door to their yeah. suite? 
Okay. So one's yes. enclosed yeah, totally. in a larger space. The other one is uh, come over here and have COVID with me, right? <laughs> I'm sure it, it's not that. I'm, on a serious note, it's not because everybody's taking precautions to make sure people don't get sick. For sure. But, Andrew, so, that's yeah. exactly what I was talking about earlier with the folks that are in, um, you know, flexible workspaces now, like at we work with a lock and a key and they've got their private office and those I think will rebound a little quicker and, and will be easier to refill when tenants are out looking for, for new space. So let's talk about this. Let's let's go to the broker side. So thank you for sharing all of that, uh, Vicky. So, I mean, people are saying, is it a right time to cold call prospects? Is it how do we get in touch with people? Are transactions happening? Um, and you were sharing with us a little bit uh, before this this podcast slash vlog. Uh, we need to pick one thing, Bucky. Is it a vlog? Is it a podcast? What is it? Can it be everything? <laughs> D all like of the vlog. above. <laughs> it's D all of the above. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time out there. I mean, there are still deals happening. There are still tenants touring, but it far reduced volumes. Um, everyone's kind of expecting a flood of sublease space to hit the market at some point. We've been tracking it. There's been a negligible uptick, but not anything significant. Um, I have a feeling that that's going to increase a little more over the next few weeks just talking to other brokers and knowing about a, a bunch of space that's about to hit the market um there you know if people can put off the decisions that they need to make they are doing it and in my experience most landlords are being flexible i've seen some give as as little as a three-month extension um, so if they've got an approaching lease expiration or even an option rate coming up there those tenants are choosing to push that decision out by six or twelve months when hopefully the market is a little more clear and obviously probably more favorable to the tenant. Uh, but landlords on the whole know that they need to be flexible. However, they are sticking hard to rates. Most of them don't want to admit quite yet defeat that, you know, that the rent rates are going to go down. Um, again, most people expect that to happen when is up in the air as we've seen from past downturns, and that's really all we have to go on, though COVID is something no one's seen before. Um, you know, it typically takes 12 to 18 months for rents to, to really bottom out after any kind of a crisis. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting out there. And I think that, I think it's a safe bet if you can to put off your decisions if, if you're able to, because making a long-term decision right now is, is obviously not ideal. And it's, pretty difficult to do because we just simply don't know what the market is and we don't know what a good deal is because, you know, we're just basing it off of yesterday's rates. So, I mean, being a broker is not for the faint and hard, right? You have to have some risk tolerance. You don't get a salary. You eat what you kill. Transactions at the minimum it takes six months to eight months, you know, larger transactions, even longer. Uh, it's very rare that you get somebody that closes a deal in 90 days unless it's a sign call, Right. Uh, how are you, Brittany, right now generating new business so that you can continue to have income during these times? So I've always been um, a networker and, um, you know, I, I get a lot of referrals. I'm grateful for that. Um, but I've been working in Santa Monica as kind of my niche for about for the entire my entire career in real estate and prior to that i was um, at a family office venture capital firm so i got to see on the flip side how what tech companies go through in those early stages to to get funded and i think that really informed um obviously the type of client that i like to work with um but for now i think it's there's a really huge opportunity in just outreach to the people you know or people that know people you know to just get in front of them and talk to them about what's going on and there are a lot of opportunities to help and advise surrounding this and just to just to share knowledge because as brokers we have a lot of knowledge about what people are going through we talk to all these companies that may not be talking to each other and we can share some of their difficulties and just kind of you know strengthen relationships that you have and and i think i said earlier it's a lot easier right now to get decision makers on the phone you know their calls are being forwarded to their cell phones or whatever it is so it's it's um it's a good opportunity really to to make new connections that are um meaningful i think and uh, other than that i know a, a number of folks have been 
doing prospecting campaigns and email campaigns, they've gotten mixed results. Most people that I've talked to have had a pretty low response rate for any campaigns that they're doing right now. Um, but personalized outreach has, from what I've heard, been a pretty, pretty good bet. Yeah, I know, for example, uh, the connect rate usually is, uh, on average, you know, these are all statistics is you get the connect rate on a phone call is 1%, right? So that means you made 99 calls, average phone calls, seven and a half minutes, it's including leaving voicemails, people not picking up. So you can't even make 100 calls in that much. You have to spend several hours or a couple of days making that many calls to get one call back. Um, a lot of commercial real estate professionals we're talking to uh, are reporting that actually, you know, they're calling 10 people, they're getting a hold of three, four, which is a huge number, right? Um, uh, Bucky and I and Natalie did an episode on how to fish with dynamite for people uh, that can actually uh, benefit from your help. Uh, there's like a little thing that uh, I'll, I'll send you that video, Brittany. I'll copy you on it to Vicky, but I'll I'll link it in the show notes uh, or in the comments if this is shared via social on how to basically uh, use this thing to uh, send a personalized email to your network, your prospects, your contacts, advising them what to do with, during these COVID times. And when they actually open that up, it'll notify you. So that way you can pick up the phone and say, hey, Greg, I noticed that, you know, you're looking at, at the brochure. At, you know, it, do you have any questions? Just wanted to assist. Oh, no, I don't have any questions. Great. But most likely somebody will want to add an explainer on it. You can actually add your own logo and things like that. So that um, I'll put the link below so that you guys can access that. That's completely free. Just feel free to rebrand it. I think you guys will find it really, really valuable. Uh, Bucky and I, I agree with you. I just wanted to be clear because um, it, people are it's a lot easier to get them on the phone and people are being really personal right now. They're talking about their families, their kids, what they're going through with, you know, homeschooling. And so um, I think that that's another good a good opportunity because when when people are willing to talk, you know, they remember you if you're able to uh, make that connection. And Bucky, I mean, you're an anomaly, though, because you do freaking professional grade videos and drone videos of properties and TikTok and all that stuff. Like what's been sort of uh, without giving away all your secret sauce, I'm just kidding, give it all away. Um, what have you found that has helped you in, in, in transaction generation during this time? Is it just simply your network and people know you from social media and just being in a small town, every, you've done deals with everybody or wh what advice do you have for, for our audience who are, you know, struggling to generate deals uh, during this time? I would say right now with people's attention to the screen, as I'll call it, so whether it's their phone or their computer, that's where I've been dumping more money and resources into Facebook ads and into the professional video, videos like you speak of that uh, I've had recorded in the past and now I'm actually just getting it more visible. And that I'm seeing a lot more engagement than I've ever experienced. So it's a combination of actually putting money into ad spend and then also just, um, I believe, people's attention on the screen during this time. So I am engaging consistently on these platforms with, I had a message on Facebook today, a person said, do you have other properties to share? And uh, it came through a Facebook ad. So that's where I'm spending my time and seeing results. And by the way, Vicki, Brittany, if you guys haven't mm -hmm. seen the stuff that, that Bucky puts out, it is crazy. I'll email it to you. I'll also link it uh, on the show notes and in the comment section if this is shared on social media because one, you got to start following him on on on, on YouTube because apparently I've been missing out with yeah Bucky he's there so there they look, look it like literally looks like million dollar listing Rochester Minnesota <laughs> wow for, for commercial real wait. estate it's fantastic That's he awesome. does great work um, yeah so how can somebody get a hold of you Brittany um, email cell phone Instagram Twitter LinkedIn do, do you mind sharing your your I will share your, all of it. Okay, great. So um, go ahead and send us that. We'll link it in the show notes. And Vicki, where can they find you and your company? Uh, LinkedIn is the best. I'm on LinkedIn all the time, just as you. <laughs> I literally can see you every day. So <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Fantastic. And let well, me I've, also note that uh, Cressa.com, our blog right now, has a lot of great content and white papers for clients. I know most of the firms do, but ours is all tenant focused. And so there's a lot of good content on there for back to work and just planning for your, your business during this time and things that you can be thinking about. So it's, it's a really good resource for tenants. 
Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, we'll link to that also in the show notes. Um, thank you all for being here. Bucky, you're amazing, man. It was so good to see you yesterday on the CRE marketing call and then see you again today. You have no idea how much love I have for you, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, so Brittany, Vicky, Keep thank you so much for today. attending. It was a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vicky. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Until Thanks. next time. Bye-bye. Bye.